Yes, um, thank you uh, very much, Andy. I mean, I think having heard from one uh, major multilateral about how they're seeing the changing challenge and, and one important bilateral on their perspective, trying to give a bit of the, the context uh, for, for this work and drawing, as Andy said, on, on two recent pieces of work, and sorry for the shameless self-promotion here, but the first is, as mentioned, uh, Andrew Rogerson and Homi Farris's Horizon 2025, which came out about a year ago, I think it was, um, that was very much a sort of bird's eye view on the future of development cooperation, uh, which some of you may be familiar with already, and a more pre recent piece of work um, by Andrew and Alicia, who's also there, and myself, looking at the trends in um, at country level from the new aid landscape. So trying to understand more from the country perspective as to the impacts of the changing aid landscape at country level and the, and the country perspectives and priorities in terms of how they manage their, those flows. I'll try to be quick in the interest of um, time. Um, so starting with Horizon, I think Horizon looks at both the demand side and the supply side of development cooperation. Um, and on the demand side, I'm particularly focusing on some of the issues around where poor, peop poor people are living that, that Peter has already touched on. And I think this graph is particularly striking because um, what it's showing is the trends in poverty reduction overall, which is the uh, gray line um, in uh, stable uh, countries, which is the blue line, not sorry, non-fragile countries, which is the blue line, and then the fragile states, which is the sort of orangey brown line at the bottom. Very dramatic. You can see the kind of progress that Peter was referring to in the non-fragile countries. Fragile countries, uh, poverty has remained uh, more or less static, and I think the point that Andrew makes is, well, at least it hasn't got worse, but it shows that in several decades of aid, we haven't actually made a lot of progress in, in tackling poverty reduction in, in fragile states, and that is likely uh, to be a challenge going forward, and I would agree with your analysis that you know, by 2025, that's where the, the majority of poor people are, are going to be living. Then thinking about um, currently the motives for development finance, the most obvious one at the moment, um, or in general, is, is the social welfare motive, which we all know about in terms of poverty reduction um, and the MDGs. That's, uh, a, a, I think, widely accepted motivation for giving development finance. But there are two other important motivations, and I think that one of the messages of Horizon 2025 is that these are likely to become more prominent uh, in future. The first, I the, the, the second on the list there is of the sort of mutual interest motive in growth, trade, and investment. And my personal sense is that you know this used to be slightly more predominant. It's been less predominant over the last 10 or 15 years as a result of the MDG era, but I think going forward is likely to become even more prominent. Um, and the third, which I think is a, is a newer one, is around the collective interest and the, and the shared global commons, and I think the kind of climate change challenge, which uh, has been so uh, well and slightly frighteningly elaborated from us, uh, for us by, by Warren, is, 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 is the first among those, but obviously there are also uh, global challenges around health, pandemics, around security, uh, uh, and so on. Now, what the Horizon uh, 2025 paper does is to identify basically um, three big disruptors for each of those motivations. Um, so for social welfare, the argument is that the sort of new impact for philanthropy and private giving will be a major disruptor um, to the current model that donors have in terms of providing uh, the, the, the sort of social welfare MDG-focused aid, and particularly the growth of um, the ability, for example, to make cash transfers to uh, poor people through your mobile phone. You can, uh, again, uh, to lift Andrew's example, you know, in 20 seconds we can pick up our phones and we can transfer money to a household in Kenya, select it at random. We can do that very easily. So we may actually, as citizens of donor countries, decide we don't need DFID, we don't need Belgium, we can actually just transfer the money directly to poor people ourselves, and that that is potentially quite a major uh, challenge for the for the for the mainstream bilateral. So it'd be interesting to hear your your views on that, Peter. The second, in terms of mutual interest, um, I is these blended packages of trade, investment, and finance, um, particularly coming from South South cooperation. We know that South South cooperation is is growing very rapidly, and that that might provide uh, be quite uh, disruptive mm. in terms of the mutual interest aid. And then, in terms of the collective interest, climate change financing. Um, there's a whole debate about <coughs> climate finance, additionality, should it be additional, how do we measure it? Um, but it does have a potential to really reshape aid quite fundamentally in ways that we, we perhaps have not uh, yet 
fully understand in terms of the way that funding is allocated, uh, how it's spent, the objectives of, of development cooperation, and, and so on. I'm going to skip over the next couple of slides, just in the interest of time. Um, but I wanted to draw now on the uh, research that we've done at country level, which, as I mentioned, is really trying to understand what does this mean for countries, um, and what are their objectives, how are they responding, and, and seeing the new trends. Firstly, obvious, one of the obvious trends is that ODA is now less important than domestic uh, resource mobilization and private flows, particularly in mix. This is not so much a trend in, in low-income countries. We've heard a lot um, today, during the day, um, in the discussion that Andy mentioned about the, 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 the death of ODA being greatly exaggerated, particularly in low-income countries. But certainly in mix, um, actually... Uh, ODA GNI ratio is nearly halved during the year, in, during the, the last decade, whereas tax revenues, FDIs, and remittances have all increased quite substantially. Um, the other thing that's happening just within the world of development assistance is a shift uh, away from the traditional towards the less traditional or newer, or we don't actually have the right word, to be quite honest, for how we describe some of these different flows. But some of the calculations we did for the age of choice suggested that in 2000, the uh, DAC bilateral and multilaterals um, accounted for about 92% of all development assistance. By 2009, they only accounted for about 69% of development assistance, with the balance being made up of South-South cooperation, philanthropy, social impact investment, climate funds, and global funds. Um, and our expectation, although we don't have the data, is that probably that share has, has the share of the traditional has, has further fallen as philanthropy and South-South and so on have grown much faster than, than DACO in the last uh, couple of years. Just to illustrate that graphically, first thing that um, strikes you from this graph is, is, is that actually overall development assistance has grown pretty rapidly between 2000 and 2009. But within that, as you can see, in 2000 it was pretty much all... DAC bilateral and multilateral, and by 2009, the, the share is, is, is much more even. So how are countries responding? Uh, this is just a very quick set of headlines from, from our paper. Um, but in general, we found that, probably unsurprisingly, countries did welcome more choice and more finance. Um, we we asked them specifically what their priorities were when it came to the sort of terms and conditions of the development assistance they received. We didn't go in saying the Paris agenda is the, the you know, the, the Paris principles are the right principles and measuring how these other actors perform against Paris principles, but we went in saying, what are your priorities? Um, and what they came up with was ownership, alignment, and speed being absolutely critical. And they measured the non-DAC donors uh, very well against these criteria. Some of the global funds and some of the philanthrop philanthropic funds did not do quite so well. I should stress this is only based on three countries. Um, we would need to have a much wider analysis to understand if this is shared across countries, but this is from the countries uh, we looked at, which was Ethiopia, Zambia, and, and Cambodia. And the third point was that countries are actually taking quite a strategic approach to how they're managing donors. Um, they're starting to say no to conditionality when they, when they um, don't agree with the conditions that are being applied. They're playing off donor groups to a certain extent against each other. Um, and so they are being actually quite strategic in how they manage this, this new landscape. So what does this all mean for the, um, the so-called traditional, uh, the DAC bilaterals and the, and the multilaterals? I think there's, there's really four things. Um, first is this new age of competition or choice, um, and this may mean that donors having to sell themselves more at country level. If countries can actually start to say, well, we like this kind of finance, we don't like that sort of finance, then actually it, it, it may mean that countries have to compete a little bit more, donors have to compete a little bit more um, to actually have their aid accepted by countries, which in my mind is, is not necessarily at all a, a bad thing. Um, the second is around declining influence of donors and certainly policy conditionality being uh, less effective for good or for ill. You know, I think in some cases that can be a good thing, it can strengthen ownership, but I think some of the conditions around human rights, around good governance, it may be that the traditional donors find that they are less able to have that sort of dialogue at country level. 
Thirdly, the traditional aid coordination mechanisms that have very much been the sort of mainstay of implementation of the Paris Agenda um, may prove less effective. The reason for this is that what we found in countries, particularly in Cambodia and Ethiopia, is that um, a lot of the, the non-DAC donors particularly were not all that interested in joining these aid coordination mechanisms and often the government wasn't all that interested in them joining those mechanisms either. And in some cases, that can mean that actually they just become less effective because actually the key players are, are not at the, the table and they become less relevant. So for donors thinking about how they coordinate, how they dialogue with government, that's potentially quite a big trend. And then finally, I suppose this is more of sort of summing up of the other three, is that it may be that the so-called traditional donors need to really... Um, consider their comparative advantage in this in this crowded marketplace. So I'll stop there, Andy. Thank Thanks you. very much, Romilly. Um, struck to a degree, as I was in the discussion earlier, by a disjuncture between a language of people competing in a marketplace, <laughs> which takes for granted that ends are broadly as wanted at the country level, and the <coughs> presentation from Ryan <coughs> that was a big challenge <coughs> in the sense, because it's about an agenda that goes beyond, if you like, what any one country is likely to assemble for itself. Um, I'm not going to attempt to sort of direct questions into groups at this point, but just see how they come. Um, we've got time for a good discussion. We've got about 40 minutes. We are being live streamed, so bear that in mind. Please introduce yourselves um, when you ask a question, and I may also get some questions from the online audience later, so we'll see how that goes. But can we just kick off any any anyone want to start? 